John chapter 1, this morning, uh, the Lord has laid this message on my heart long ago. And uh, this is uh, something I've been praying on, meditating on, and, and just seeking what the Word of God says about this topic. And I know that this morning is the, the day God wants me to preach this. And I'd ask you again, just open your heart, let God give you what you need from His Word this morning. The title of the message is this, Sources of Doubt. Sources of Doubt. Uh, doubt is something very real that we all struggle with. Doubt. And I want to see what the Word of God says about doubt. Where does doubt come from? Uh, does it come from the devil? Does it come from the Holy Spirit? Does it come from our own uh, weaknesses? Well, I want to answer those questions from the Word of God this morning. And again, I'd ask you to open your heart to what God has for you. John chapter 1 I want you to notice verse 28. And I'm going to take a five second time out. Excuse me. Thank you. John chapter 1 verse 28. John the Baptist was sent before Jesus Christ to introduce him to the world. The Bible says in John 1 28, these things were done in Beth Abra beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Before I go on, let me say the first introduction, the official introduction of Jesus to the world is this verse right here. And He did not say, Behold the great miracle worker. Amen. He didn't say, uh, Behold the all-powerful, though He is the all-powerful, the almighty. He didn't say that. What did He say? He said, Behold the Lamb of God. Why? Because that's the main reason Jesus came. Jesus came to be the sacrifice for our sins. If you're here today and you're lost, you can't be saved any other way than through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for you. Amen. You can't be saved by church membership. You can't be saved by church attendance. I'm glad you're here, but that won't save you. Right. You can't be saved by your good works or, or by being baptized. None of those things will save you. The only way you can be saved is by putting your faith and trust in the Lamb of God who paid the full price for your sin. Amen. So here's John. His job is to introduce Jesus to the world. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Then John continues, This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. So the Lord told John, he said, The one that you see the Spirit of God descending upon, that's the Lamb of God. That's the one you're to introduce to the world. Verse 34, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. If you continue reading in Scripture, you'll find about John the Baptist that Jesus said there hasn't been a one born among women greater than John the Baptist. John's job was to introduce Jesus to the world. John was a strong man. He was a bold man. He was a man of courage and one who introduced Jesus to the world. And then in Matthew 14, we find that John was preaching and he said, it's unlawful for thee uh, to have your brother's wife, he said. And, and uh, he was thrown into prison because of his preaching. And now look at Luke chapter 7, please. Here's the man who introduced Jesus to the world. He's thrown into prison because of his preaching. And now look at Luke 7, verse 18. In Luke 7, we won't read all of it for sake of time, but Jesus is performing miracles. Verse 18, and the disciples of John showed him of all these things. Where's John? He's in prison. He's in prison for preaching the truth. A preacher of righteousness. Notice verse 19. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? 
Now wait a minute, John, I thought you're the one who told me he was the one to come. John, wait a minute, I thought you were the one who told me, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. John, I thought you were the one that was your job to introduce Jesus, and now you're asking, is he really the one? John, what, what's wrong? What's wrong is John had the same struggle that we all have, and that's doubt. John said, art thou he that should come? Well, John, you should know if you introduced him to the world. Or look me for another, verse 20. When the men were come unto him, John's disciples came to Jesus. They said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look me for another. Let's pray together. Lord, speak to our hearts this morning. Give us what we need from your word. Lord, again, I ask you, if there's someone here that's lost, may they trust you as Savior today. Lord, Holy Spirit, just meet the needs that are in this room as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. What's the first source of doubt? Number one, let me say the first source of doubt is human weakness. Human weakness. Here's the man who introduced Jesus to the world. And he's saying, behold the Lamb of God. Are you really? Here's the Savior of the world. Are you really? He takes away the sin of the world. Does he really? Now, Christian, face the truth. Have you ever had doubt? Have you ever faced doubt in your life? Can I tell you one of the sources of that doubt is your own human weakness. It's your own inability to see things as God sees. It's, your, it's our own lack of knowledge uh, to, to not see things the way God sees them. Thomas, who had walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus. Look at John 20, please. Thomas, who was one of the apostles, he was one of the, the original apostles, had been called to follow Jesus. He had done great works for Jesus and even preached about Jesus. But here, Jesus has died on the cross like He told us He would. He was buried like He told us He would be. And He rose again like He said He would. And He appeared to the other apostles, but Thomas wasn't with them. And so they told Thomas that Jesus had appeared to them after He had risen from the dead. And I want you to see what Thomas said. John 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Thomas was an analyzer. He was a double checker about everything. Verse 25, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. Amen. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that he might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing Amen. he might have life through his name. Amen. What causes doubt in a, a human humankind? Our own human weakness. Our own inabilities. Our, our own, what we think we know so much. The truth is, if you live 80 years or 100 years, we've just, we've just scratched the surface of, of the history of man. Right. We've just barely tapped into anything. In fact, the older you get, you feel like you learn more. Sometimes you feel like you've learned less. You, think, you realize how much you don't know the older you get. And, uh, and you realize you're just getting started in this thing of knowledge. The fact is, though, our own human weakness can cause us to doubt. Uh, other human beings' weaknesses can cause us to doubt. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure. What treasure? The treasure of the gospel. The treasure of the truth of Scripture. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What's that talking about? In these bodies of clay. Right. You know something that will shake your faith to the very core? Is when there's a spiritual leader you've looked to. And that spiritual leader falls. Or that spiritual leader lets you down. You know what happens if you're not careful? You are so focused on that spiritual leader. You are so focused on that man that you forgot that the man was carrying the treasure. And what's the treasure? It's the Word of God. It's the Gospel. It's the truth of God. That man may fail. That vessel may break. But the truth hasn't changed. The truth hasn't changed. God's Word is 
still God's word and the gospel is still true and it's still the only way to heaven no matter what happens to that vessel. And so sometimes human weakness in others can cause doubt in our own hearts. We can question everything we've heard when a fellow brother or sister of Christ fall by the wayside. Asaph had the same problem. We read this on Wednesday night. We're going to read just a taste of this. Look at Psalm 73. Asaph, in mean, his own human weakness, he had his doubts about whether it was really worth it to serve God or not. And the reason he had his doubts was he was looking around and it sure seemed like the wicked people were having a good time. And it sure seemed like the wicked people were prospering. And it sure seemed like there were no consequences for forsaking God. And so Asaph, honestly, and we don't have time to read all Psalm 73. I hope you'll read it later. But notice what he said, Psalm 73, verse 1. He said, truly God is good to Israel. He said, I know God's good. Even to such as of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there where your feet were almost gone? You knew the truth, but you were having such waves of doubt, such waves of fear, and such waves of trouble. You know, for John, perhaps it was that trouble. He took a stand for Jesus Christ, and now he's thrown into prison. By the way, not much later, he was beheaded. His whole earthly ministry only lasted about six months. And we can face trouble and we can see the wicked seeming to prosper and we can have doubts because of our own weakness. And Asaph said, as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And if you continue reading Psalm 73, he enumerates all the things that he saw that made him doubt God, that made him doubt God's goodness. And then you look down in Psalm 73, verse 17. He says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. He said, the day came I went to church in so many words. I heard the word in so many words. And God helped me understand this life is temporary. These people who are living in wickedness, oh, they may have pleasure in sin, but it's for a season. It's a short season. Why do we have doubt? What's the first source of our doubt? Human weakness, whether it be in us or in someone else. It can cause us to doubt. We have to be careful not to... It, we, we trust our own feelings way too much. We do. Right. We trust our own experiences way too much. Right. You know what we need to trust? Amen. The eternal God. Amen. The one who told us the truth. Right. I want you to see the second source of doubt. The second source of doubt is Satan himself. <laughs> Look at Genesis chapter 3, please. Genesis chapter 3. The second source of doubt is Satan. I want you to see what Satan wants you to doubt. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, please. You know the story how God created Adam and Eve and gave them a perfect paradise to live in. And He gave them to eat of all the trees of the garden. But there was just one that God said, don't eat of. For the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. By the way, that's the way God's promises are. Some people say, well, you're a Christian, so you can't do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. No, the truth is, as a Christian, you have liberty in Jesus Christ. And the things God tells you to stay away from are the things that would hinder your liberty. Look at Genesis 3. I want you to see what Satan wanted Eve to doubt. Look at Genesis 3, verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? What is Satan questioning, folks? He has not changed his tactics. Right. What is he questioning? He's questioning the Word of God. He's questioning the Word of God. Yea, hath God said? That's the battle Satan wants to wage in your heart today. Well, I know what the Bible says, but boy, I hear what the news says. I know what the Bible says, but I know what the public school says. What? I know what the Bible says, but I know what my friends say. I know what the Bible says, but I know how I feel sometimes. Folks, Satan wants to separate you from the Word of God. Why? Because this is the one thing that can give you life. This is the one thing that can reveal truth to you. This is the one thing that can protect you and guide you in this life. What did he do? He questioned God's Word. By the way, this is a side note. There's a reason we as a church only use the King James Bible. There's a reason for that. 
Right. It is a legitimate question. People say, well, how can you know which one's right when there's so many Bibles? That's a legitimate question. Right. Let me answer that for you. There aren't so many Bibles. Right. There's one for the English-speaking people, and it's the King James Bible. I won't get into that in detail today, but there's a reason God preserved His Word for us in this book. Amen. Notice, Satan questioning God's Word. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Eve got a little sloppy with what God had said, and she changed what God said. Say, what's well, not that big a deal? It was just a small change. Folks, this isn't our word. This is God's word. Right. And she changed it ever so slightly. But it's those slight changes that bring death. Yeah. It's those slight differences. The closer something is to the truth without being the truth, the more dangerous it is. Right. Yeah. Notice. She said, you shall not eat of it. God said, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And I want you to see the third digression. And this is how Satan still works today. He'll question God's Word, then he'll change God's Word, and then notice the third thing, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. What did he do? He just outright denied God's Word is truth. Right. He said, that book isn't the truth that you hold in your hands. Folks, where is this doubt coming from? It's coming straight from the pit of hell. It's coming straight from Satan. It's satanic influence. God, uh, God told them the truth when He told them, if he, in the day ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And Satan sowed the seed of doubt. Say, that won't really happen, Eve. Eve, come on. Not only did he cause them to doubt God's Word, he caused them to doubt God's goodness. Right. You see, if, if you don't believe that God has nothing but the best intended for you, then you'll ignore what He tells you to do. But if you believe in your heart and you don't doubt in your heart that God wants nothing but the best for you, you know what you'll do? You'll listen to Him. You'll obey Him. <laughs> Because you trust Him. And what Satan wants to do is sow the seed of doubt. Well, maybe God really doesn't have the best in mind for you. When you face a trouble, you face a trial, what else does He want you to doubt? He wants you to doubt God's way of salvation. Look at Genesis 3.15. By the way, this is the first prophecy about Jesus Christ coming. Notice Genesis 3.15. Satan wants you to doubt the correct means of salvation. There's only one way to be saved, folks. There's only one way to heaven. Say, Pastor, you think it's your way? Or are you that narrow-minded to think it's your way? It's not my way. It's Jesus' way. Amen. Jesus said unto him, I am the way. He didn't say there's a bunch of ways. He said, I'm the way. The truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And here in Genesis 3.15, we see the first prophecy of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, coming to this earth. Notice Genesis 3.15 it says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, speaking of Satan and Eve and, and mankind and between thy seed Satan's seed and her seed. Now that's an interesting phrase. Normally it wouldn't be a woman's seed. It'd be a man's seed. Why did he say her seed? Because he's talking about the virgin born son of God right. Jesus who had come to this earth who's God's son right. who would die on the cross for our sins. Amen. He said, between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. He said, listen, when you all have the final showdown, what's going to happen? You're going to hurt his heel. You're going to bruise him. But when that happens, he's going to crush you. He's going to destroy you, Satan. That's Jesus Christ. And what Satan wants you to doubt is God's way of salvation. Turn to 2 Corinthians, please. And this leads me to number three. Who, who's the third group of people, the third person that will cause you to doubt? A third source of doubt. And let me say it as truthfully as I can. Satan's preachers will cause you to doubt. You say, Satan has preachers? He absolutely does. So how do I know if you're one, Pastor? There's only one way to tell if any preacher is one of Satan's preachers. Well, hear me carefully. It's not how smooth you talk. Right. How nice you talk. You know, Satan's preachers don't have horns on their head. Folks. Right. They don't carry around pitchforks. <coughs> they don't have a tail coming out from behind their suit coat. They don't. You know what? They look just like God's preachers. 
They look just like them. In fact, sometimes they might even sound better than them. They might even be more polished. They might even have more knowledge in the world than God's preachers. But there's a way you can tell God's preachers from Satan's preachers. There's only one way. That's by this book. Amen. Does what they say measure up with this book? Folks, don't buy into the fact that what every preacher says because he's a nice guy is truth. Amen. It might be a lie straight from hell. Right. Look at Galatians. I'm sorry, you're in 2 Corinthians. Let's look at that first. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You're probably already there. Oh no, you're not yet either. Okay, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Notice what Paul said. Paul had told people the truth about how to be saved. The truth of how to be saved is Jesus is the only way. It's not based on how good you can be, how many works you can perform. You can't be saved by turning over a new leaf, trying to change your life. That won't save you. Because what we are at best is sinners who need a Savior. Amen. And I want you to see what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. He said, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, he tricked Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Folks, true salvation is simple. Right. I do right. believe in easy believism. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? I mean Jesus did the hard part when He suffered for all my sins on an old rugged cross. Jesus did the hard part when He was buried for my sin. And Jesus did the amazing thing by rising again. And all I can do as a sinner, depraved, lost, is come to Him and ask for mercy and depend on what He did for me to save my soul. Amen. Just like that man who said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And he went home to his house justified. Why? Because... You can't be saved by any good work you can do. And Paul said, I'm concerned that your minds would be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he goes on further. He said, you've been receiving some of these preachers. Verse 4, notice, he said, for if he that cometh, whether he come on the radio or the TV or the internet or in the church house, he that cometh, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, who we have not preached, notice they'll use the name of Jesus. But if you preach another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. He said, listen, you're putting up with this false doctrine. Then look further on, 2 Corinthians 11, look at verse 13. He said, for such are false apostles. He's talking about these false preachers. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan doesn't look like a devil right. with horns and a tail, pitchfork, and smell like sulfur. No, he looks like an angel of light. Amen. He's deceitful. Verse 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. There are preachers out there now who teach a false repentance. Right. They say, listen, you have to be saved by repenting. What first glance that sounds right. right. Because you do have to be saved by repenting. The Bible says repent and be, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. But what does repentance mean? It means a change of mind. Amen. What makes you lost, folks? There's only one thing that makes you lost. That's unbelief. That's not placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Repentance is a matter of turning from whatever you've been trusting to Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the only true repentance. You cannot... People say, I've repented of all my sin. Have you really? Have you really turned from all your sin? The Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. These are false preachers preaching that you must turn from all your sin. There's false preaching called Lordship Salvation. It says you have to make Jesus Lord of your life or you can't be saved. Folks, can I remind you that before we're saved, we're dead in our trespasses and sins. And a dead man can't show evidence of life. Next time you go to a funeral, now don't actually do this, okay? The next time you go to a funeral, that coffin's open. You go say anything you want to that dead man. He won't get upset. He won't do anything. Why? He's dead. 
You know, before we're saved, you know what we are in our sins? We're dead. You know what we need? We can't, we can't show good works to get us to heaven when we're dead. You know what we need? We need a resurrection. We need the Holy Spirit of God. We need Jesus Christ to save us and give us life. There is this false thing going around called making a commitment to Christ. Some people say you get saved by making a commitment to Christ. Again, at first glance, it sounds kind of right. Because Paul said, I, I, I believe that uh, he's faithful to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. But can I tell you, the only thing you commit to Christ to be saved is your eternal destiny, is your soul. You, you don't have the willpower. I don't have the willpower to make a commitment to Christ. Well, Lord, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that so you can save me. No, folks, the commitment was made by Christ to us. Amen. And what was His commitment? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Amen. What about baptism? There's some large churches in our area that teach now, they won't come out and say it brazenly, but they teach. You look at their doctrine and they believe the way you administer God's grace is by going through that tank back there. Folks, can I tell you something? That can't wash away physical stink. And it certainly can't wash away spiritual stink called sin. Listen, Satan's preachers, they don't look ugly. They look nice. They talk smooth. They're very deceitful. So how do I know, Pastor? Look at what the book says. What's the Word say? If what they're preaching doesn't match with this, I don't care how nice they are. I don't care how much they smile. I'll try to smile more, okay? I don't care how much they smile. You know what? This matter, what matters is the truth. The truth. What are sources of doubt? Human weakness. Satan himself. He'll cause people to doubt. Satan's preachers will sow seeds of doubt in your mind. Be careful who you're listening to on the radio just because he sounds smooth. Right. Right. Match it up to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Last of all, number four, there is someone else who does cause doubt. And his intentions are pure. And his intentions are to save your soul. That's, right. Amen. That's the Holy Spirit of God. You know, perhaps you're here this morning and you're depending on your works, your religion, the fact that you've turned over a new leaf to get you to heaven. You know what the Holy Spirit's doing right now? He wants you to doubt that false foundation upon which you stand. You know, doubt can be a good thing. You know, as a kid, we used to go out in the woods and we'd grab a hold of vines. Tarzan. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Tarzan, you know, he'd swing on the trees. And we'd go out and grab a vine. And we were Tarzan. <laughs> Don't act like you didn't do it. Yeah, you didn't do it. We'd go out there in the woods. You know what you do with that vine first? You go. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll hold. And guess what? Sometimes it did. Sometimes it didn't. You'd been smarter to doubt that vine. Climb up a tree. There's a branch. You need to learn tree climbing, okay? Don't ever let go of... You've got to have three points on the tree at all times. You can't just put all your weight on a faulty branch. You better make sure that branch will hold you. It's good to doubt things that may cause you harm. Folks, if you're here this morning saying, well, this is against all that I've heard... I hope you'll doubt if you're depending on the wrong foundation for your salvation. Amen. I hope if you're depending on your good works, you'll realize the truth and you'll doubt this morning because that's what the Holy Spirit will get you to do. He'll get you to doubt the things that will harm you. Look at John chapter 16, please. John chapter 16. What will the Holy Spirit do? We're almost done this morning, but the Holy Spirit will cause you to doubt if you need to doubt. If you've never thought about where you're going to spend eternity, heaven or hell, you need to have some doubt about that. Amen. And you need to not just be asleep all through the rest of your life just saying, well, it'll all work out in the end. Folks, that's Satan's kind of language. He right. hopes that's what you'll do. Right. Right. You need to wake up. John 16, verse 7, Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient. It's good for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit of God, will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send Him unto you. And when He, was come, when he has come, He will reprove the world of sin 
You know, he'll make you doubt. He'll make you doubt that that life of sin you're living is really worth it. He'll make you doubt that that life of sin is really going to fulfill what you want out of life. And notice, and of righteousness, he'll make you doubt how righteous you think you are. He'll make you realize you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And notice what else? And of judgment, he'll make you doubt. Hey, I'm okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, hey, I can just live and die. and I can believe whatever I want to and I'll still make it to heaven. The Holy Spirit will make you doubt. Why? Because the truth is, you can't believe whatever you want to and still get to heaven. Right. Amen. God said there's one way. Amen. It's through Jesus Christ. Amen. The Holy Spirit will make you doubt. Uh, I've told you my own testimony before. I was raised in a Christian home. When I was a young teenager, I began to doubt my salvation. Would I spend eternity in heaven or hell? And in hindsight, I won't retell you the whole story, but I believe I was doing what 2 Corinthians 3, 5, uh, 13, 5 rather says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Folks, you ought to examine yourself whether you're saved. I'm not trying to get you to doubt your salvation if you're saved. But I am trying to get you to examine, are you biblically saved? Do you just think you're saved because mom and dad said you were? Do you just think you're saved because you've always been in church? Do you just think you're saved because you've always loved God? Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not uh, your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Are you reprobate or redeemed this morning? Which are you? How can I know if I'm redeemed, Pastor? There's only one way. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you're depending on your works, you're lost. If you're depending on your church membership, you're lost and you need a Savior. Ephesians 6.17 says that we're to take the helmet of salvation. You need to be saved, but you need to know without a doubt you're saved. Once I got the assurance of my salvation, God used Acts 10.43 in my life to Him, to Jesus. Give all the prophets witness that through His name, whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. And when I read that verse in my room as a young teenager, I got it settled. In hindsight, I believe I was saved as a young man. But I was examining myself hard, whether I was in the faith. A few years passed and I was getting ready to go to Bible college. I was working three jobs, saving up money. I was at Bissell, making vacuums. Carpet cleaners, all that good stuff. And one day, just out of the blue, now I believe it was the Holy Spirit of God when I was a teenager saying, examine yourself. But I'd had that settled for a few years. And one day, just out of the blue, this thought just came. I'm preparing for ministry, preparing to go to college, Bible college, to learn ministry. And this thought came out of the blue. Are you really saved? I don't think it was the Holy Spirit that time. I believe it was Satan. Because here's the thing, Christian. If you don't know without a doubt you're saved, you're going to be ineffective in God's battle. You're going to be ineffective. You won't be in the battle. You will be the battle. And it just discouraged me. And I thought, what in the world? I, I thought I had this settled years ago. And I went to break, break rather discouraged. And I went into the break room and I was just praying and saying, Lord, I, where did this come from? Just out of the blue. And I do believe it was a satanic attack. And I was there in the break room with my Bible open and a lady came in and not acting very much like a Christian lady. She came in and she saw the Bible and she goes, huh, that's a good book, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's a good book. She said, read Psalm 139. Well, okay. To the best of my knowledge, I've never seen her before, never seen her since. I opened my Bible 139. Oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but Lord, Lord, O oh Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain unto it. For sake of time, I won't read the whole passage, but later on it says, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with thee. Amen. You know what combated that doubt in my mind? The Word of God. The Word of God. The Holy Spirit will cause you to doubt. If you're lost, He will. He'll be knocking on your heart's door saying, You need to be saved. But Satan sometimes, in our own human weakness and other human beings' weakness, will cause us to doubt. What about John? Let's get the end of the story. Look at Luke 7. John's the one who said, 
Behold the Lamb of God. And taking away the sin of the world. Later on he said, are you really the Lamb of God? Do you really take away the sin of the world? He's the Lamb of God. Go follow him. Are you really who I thought you were? And I want you to see what Jesus tells John's disciples. And Jesus is referring to some Old Testament scripture. You know what he does to combat John's doubt? The Word of God. He actually tells him some prophecies about the, about the Messiah from Isaiah 35, 4 through 6, and Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And here's what Jesus said when John the Baptist's disciples came, verse 20, when the men, Luke 7, 20, when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel is preached. John knew what he's referring to, the book of Isaiah. Verse 23, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended at me. What cured John's doubts? The word of God. Amen. In Mark chapter 9, and I'll be done with this, there's a young man, a, a dad rather, who brought his son to Jesus. He wanted help. He actually brought his son to the disciples first and they couldn't help him. So then Jesus comes and, and Jesus said, if you believe. He said, if you believe, all things are possible if you believe. And here's what the man said. He cried out with tears and here's what he said. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. You know, if you're here today and you would like to believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior, could you just have enough faith to come to the right person. You see, that's what that man was saying. Lord, I believe. What was he saying? Lord, I believe I came to the right place for help. Lord, I believe I'm talking to the right person. If anybody can help me, it's you. Lord, I still have a lot of doubt, though. Help thou my unbelief. Are you here today and you're lost? Would you have enough faith just to come to Jesus? Say, Lord, I do believe you died for me. I do believe you were buried and rose again. Lord, help my unbelief. I've heard, heard people say, if you're really saved, you'll never, ever, ever doubt. And that's just not true. If you're here and you're not saved, I want to encourage you to trust Christ. If you're here and you're saved, you have doubts, go to the Word of God. Amen. Listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Let Him cure your doubt. Let's bow Hi everybody, this is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, In death and hell... We're cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. 
He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.